Well, they blew up the chicken man in Philly last night. Now they blew up his house, too, because he didn't listen to the Stick to Wrestling podcast. (laughs) Our listeners can be a bit overzealous sometimes. Sorry about that, chicken man. But I do know this. Give us 60 minutes and we will give you a wicked good podcast every single time. One thing I have wanted to kind of add to this show, this show is going to be released on at midnight, uh, Friday, September the 20th. And I want to go back and like see if something really important happened in wrestling history or if someone had a birthday. And I was getting birthdays from guys, literally wrestlers named Homeless Tom. I couldn't get a decent wrestler on there. But this time we got lucky. September 20th, we have... A a legendary wrestler who turns 73 on this date. He is a WWE Hall of Famer and a five-time WWE Tag Team Champion. Stick to Wrestling Nation. Let's hear it for Tony Guerrilla. And with that, I will bring on my convivial co-host, Mr. Sean Goodwin. Sean, everything's back to normal and you're back with us. More importantly, Tony's hair is 72. So that's that's I mean that because that hair is the most exciting thing about Tony. Um, How did you like Tony Guerrilla if he regularly wrestled in Portland? That's the burning question. If he regularly wrestled where? In Portland. In Portland? Yeah, you get this out of Massachusetts, so I'm good. (laughs) Brilliant! I love it. Tell us about our our Facebook page, please, sir. So we got a Facebook page, uh, uh, page, and um, it's uh, our, our companion piece, our PBS Civil War tote bag, if you will. Um, uh, where, yeah, where we basically talk about the show. We talk about, you know, basically just wrestling, and that's kind of the beauty of it. No one ever argues for that very reason, because it's really hard to argue about 1985, uh, you know, Great American Bash. Well, it's good. Uh, some find people find a way. Go really ahead. Close. I would hope not. <laughs> yeah, human nature being what it is. But yeah, the, the uh, Facebook page, it's kind of like an old school message board where we yeah. get to talk wrestling and Sean and I will you know, jump in as often as we can. And, you know, and yeah, I get taunted about my Tennessee volunteers being as freaking awful as they are. But anyway, that's just like life. But um, that's the beauty of the, uh, the wrestling page is you don't have to talk about them there. They make me, Sean. They make me. I, I have a guy who starts a thread every week, like mercil- mercilessly taunting me about like Tennessee getting mauled by Georgia State in the most humiliating afternoon of my life. And the Florida games this week, so things are not going to improve. But Ew. speaking of things improving, uh, we're back to normal. We are recording 24 hours, about 24 hours, before the podcast gets out, comes out, and back to normal so it's going to have a fresh sound uh, if something happened uh, f- a few days earlier we could talk about it the way you know when harley race passed away we missed out on the opportunity of the week where the longhorn steakhouse became the most hated heel in wrestling and that makes me sad but with that i want to bring on our guest he is on for the first time he is the coolest cat in the alley he is las vegas's own brandon rice brandon thank you for coming on I appreciate the invite, fellas. Thank you for having me. No, thank you for being here. I anticipate this is going to be an outstanding show. Our discussion point this week, uh, about 30 years ago this week, we're a little bit late on it, but at the Carolina Coliseum in Columbia, South Carolina, the, the NWA presented live on WTBS Clash of the Champions 8. And a couple of sticking points. The, the, the arena... The arena is like 11,000 seats. They drew 2,600, but it actually looked good on TV. They dolled the place up for a special event. I mean, just 10 years later, you look at what was going on on Raw and looking on, on looking at was what it looked like on Nitro. And I mean, this looked like television from the I Love Lucy era. They prettied it up. What, what do you mean pretty dumb? They just blacked out the uh, – everything from the 10th row up was black. They just took the whole thing out uh, because that's all uh, – yeah, it was uh, – it's a 12,000-seat arena, first of all, and they got 2,600 people in there. Uh, how, how does that happen? 
Uh, starters, it's 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 on it's being shown live on TV, so you can you know f- stay home for free, or you could pay to go out. Which actually pick a smaller building. <laughs> It doesn't look as good on television. I, I, what I'm saying is, for 2,600 people in a 12,000 seat building, I thought they did a good job. I, I, I suppose, but no. um, it it did do a 4.7 rating. I'm trying to remember how the rating system worked back then. Was that considered good? 4.7. Yeah, it was yeah. considered for for cable television uh, on a Tuesday night. It was actually considered excellent. Okay, so this this show was building up to the first Halloween Havoc. Brandon, do you remember this show? I do remember this show quite quite vividly, uh, and then I also kind of did a refresher um, within the last few days of of just checking it out. Uh, and I I vividly recall this main event being solid. Um, the crowd was just hot from from the jump. Uh, so it's interesting that you guys mentioned that the the capacity was you know what eleven twelve thousand, yet they only managed to fit. 2600 in there but it, it you just got the feeling that it was a little bit more than 2600 people in there uh, yes. uh and it, it, it was just hot it was hot from the beginning from the opener to the end the crowd was really really into it so it, it made it feel like much more than 2600 people i will agree that was a hot 2600 though yeah right, i mean John? it was good on television it you know i mean it, this is about what the nwa was drawing in general at the time, especially on a Tuesday night, that's a kind of a tough sell, even though, yeah, this is a really good looking card coming in. So let's uh, we start now for the main event. Um, and you you're kind of combining a couple of feuds here with the uh, Sting and Ric Flair uh, beating Dickie Slater and great, uh, the great Muda. The, the Slater thing is weird here because it was advertised as Terry Funk up until the last second. Um, I'm not sure if you know the story behind this. Um, before the main event, they kind of told us, hey, Terry Funk's not going to be wrestling tonight. And they show him in a hospital bed, I believe, in Alexandria, Louisiana. Yep. And it was a total shoot. Everything he said was a total shoot. He was in the hospital. He, uh, he had to have an emergency surgery done. And he really very nearly had to have his arm amputated because the, the infection in the arm was so bad. That was no BS. That was real. And you all think it's funny, too. <laughs> that was great. Um, but, yeah, I so – we have the match. Um, I thought it was a really good match. Um, Dick Slater held up his end. I came into this saying, you know, Dick Slater, he was really good in 85 and 86. And so was Dale Murphy and both Dick Slater and Dale Murphy sucked in 1989. Then I watched the match again and I was like, Hey, he's holding up his end. Rick has this thing over Dickie Slater where, you know, first of all, Dick is in complete Terry Funk mode here. Yes. I mean, you, you you might as well. I mean, he is doing every between the, the, the shrugging of the shoulders and the head bobs and everything. He's completely doing the Terry Funk act, but it's working. He doesn't look good here, though. He is really heavy. Yeah, he's. Uh, yeah, one of the. Go ahead, Brendan. One of the first thing one of the first things that I, I kind of noticed um, for this match was even though, you know, Slater was kind of filling in for funk in terms of the way the match flowed, it still felt kind of funkish. Um, so just in kind of glancing here at my notes here, I, I put Dick Slater as funk light because that's, <laughs> he was kind of like a diet version of Terry Funk in this match. Um, but I, I mean, I thought he, I thought he was good for, for, for what he was, for what they, they more than likely had asked him to do to kind of fill into that, to that spot there. And it worked out well because he's been in, the, if you have to have a last second replacement, put somebody in there that has been in with Flair a million times before. Because there's going to be, you know, very little adjustment he has to worry about. Yeah, you put him in there with a guy, with Ric Flair, who he's been in the ring with, and Sting, who he put Sting's head in the toilet at one point. So that that's it works out. <laughs> that's a true story. When Sting was in Mid South uh, and he fir- he first started as Blade Runner Sting, he did something to piss Dick Slater off, and Dick Slater, in a business of really tough guys, Dick Slater really might have been the toughest one of all. So not a guy to be messed with. Um, Sean, what did the the Wrestling Observer what star rating did they give this match? 
They got four and a quarter for this. And going into the match, one uh, uh, quick moment uh, thought: Poor Gordon uh, slowly looks miserable, doesn't he? I mean, particularly <laughs> miserable. Fred, what are your thoughts? Uh, with regards to Gordon Foley? Yeah. Uh, well, you know what? Honestly, I, for, for the for the most of the event, Gordon was, was, was in the back, I think, doing interviews with Gary Hart. Uh, but, yeah, I'd have to agree with uh, with SG. He he didn't look too thrilled um, during this, uh, which, which I don't know why. I mean, as somebody who's also, which we haven't mentioned him yet, I guess we'll get to him, uh, a Muda fan. Uh, I would think he'd be a little more <laughs> interested and have been a little more, you know, seemingly engaged uh, in the match. But yeah, he he didn't look like he was having a good time. The announcers here just, I mean, I, I you know, I'm still taking crap about the Shivani, the Tony Shivani comments. But uh, the announcing, he kept saying that well, Lance Russell is doing it. Uh, Jim Ross kept saying Lance Russell is doing it on the uh, on the the, the hotline. And I'm sitting, I'm sitting there. Th- Think it, don't tempt me, because if I could, I would. Because he's on here. Why are they getting away from Bob Cottle too, John? Uh, I think Bob was be was seen as being older. They wanted uh, younger, fresher faces out there. Should they have wanted that? I don't know, but that was the rationale. Um, I I just can't imagine. As much as I love Lance Russell, I mean, I think it was a dollar ninety nine the first minute, ninety nine cents each additional minute to hear alternative commentary in nineteen eighty nine currency. What is this porn? What are these porn charges? No, no, no! It's Lance Russell. <laughs> Come on, mom! You were know how much popular? I love Lance. In nineteen eighty nine, were a lot of people actually calling these? these hotlines because Ross plugged it all throughout the night. Like he was just shoving that, that, that hotline down the throat. Was it, was it something people actually really did call? Excellent question. And the answer is yes, it was a major source of revenue for WCW. I don't know, you know, how, what breaks down. I know when Jim Cornette did whatever night he did, it it went really well. I think it went uh, well with Paul Lee and Jim Ross as well. So, like I said, I do know that it was a, here's the thing. If you're, if it's 1989 and you haven't accidentally like bumped into the, the wrestling observer newsletter, like I had, I mean, you're completely in the dark. So I could see someone saying, okay, I'll pay five, maybe 10 bucks to hear some inside information that Jim Cornette or Joe Pettacino is throwing around. And this was, this was actually an early revenue source to ECW too. Yes. Uh, They're hot. They got a lot of money out of the hotline. Uh, Okay. Now before I know I'm going to start bust some people's chops, but I I just want to say this as an overall for this card, top to bottom, everybody's balls out. This is one of the best effort cards I've seen. On paper, this may not look great, but this is one of the best effort cards I've seen just from the beginning to the end. Um, These guys put out in a long time. Uh, you know what? Excellent point. And that's actually in my notes as well. Uh, you're right. Everyone really put out. You know who, who did a really good job was both Jim Ross. No surprise. This is peak Jim Ross. After his Mid-South, I scream all the time at everything phase. And before he got really burned out in 1991. Yep. And uh, we're going to get to that in a second. But I'm going to give... Uh we were already talking about him, but I'm going to give Dick Slater again props. This was his best match in about four years, at least. Um, and great, great. Uh, Muda was so good at this point. He, you could see how quickly he could adapt to anybody's style. Um, what was the plan for Muda at this point, John? Um, the plan, the long-term plan, which was to happen sometime in 1990, was that he was going to turn babyface. Uh, but right now, you know, everything that they were doing was leading to Muda and basically Gary Hart's army against the four horsemen. Um, but I, I really, I mean, Brandon, share your thoughts. What do you think? How do you think Muda would have done as a baby face? Um, to be honest, I, I much rather preferred Muda as a heel, but I think, I think as a face, he would, he would have worked, especially for that time. Uh, Muda was just doing, uh, along with you know Scott Steiner at that time, Muda was doing a lot of things that I don't think any other wrestlers in the U.S. were doing. Uh, the high wrist maneuvers, the back slips, and just his style was kind of fresh. 
Um, and it seemed to me like people kind of, kind of maybe wanted to cheer for him, but didn't really want to, um, but no, I, I think he would have done just fine. Just fine as a face. Um, I think where they ultimately, um, messed up and you can probably lend more to why this happened with him was obviously, you know, kind of jobbing him out at Starcade 89. Uh, but I'm thinking he was on his way out at that point. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think Muda as a face would have done, would have, would have done well. I think he would have fit in just, just fine with, with Sting probably right under Sting. And then eventually, you know, you're going to turn Rick back, back heel. So I think, and Lex was heel at the time. So I think he would, he would have been good as maybe a number two baby face run underneath Sting. What I, the the uh, did they have any grand plan for Muda? I mean, Muda seemed like somebody they could have pushed uh, to championship level, um, but, but it seemed to kind of die out. Did, was there like a, a plan to have give him a major run against Flair? Uh, they did give him a. a I want to say. A major run against Flair would have been like on a pay per view. The wrestling business had changed, but by, by yeah. when Starcade came around in December, uh, I think starting right around this time, he started going around. Uh, no, when when the Funk series ended, there we go. He started going around the horn against Ric Flair in main events in the major arenas. Yeah, I mean a pay per view thing, though. Um, you know what? Truth be told, these guys kind of. You have to understand NWA in 1989, it was a very chaotic time, and they really didn't have 100% knowledge of what they were doing from one pay-per-view to the next, and so I don't think they had any real concrete plans for Muda or for anyone else. Uh, Well, it's it's a shame because I I always felt like he was very underutilized. Like Brandon said, the guy was cool. I mean, he was doing stuff that no, he looked cool doing it. He he was he was kabuki, but cool. <laughs> he could be a kabuki, but muscular and without the stomach, and he could actually do stuff. Um, and he was cool. <laughs> yeah, re- one thing though, like you were talking about him maybe being a world's champion. I think his he spoke some English. I I know that firsthand, but he didn't, you know, obviously it's his second language. And I think that could have gotten in the way of of him being in the world champion. Yeah, I I know. Yeah. I, I I know they're not going to actually give him the belt, but I mean, I was just, you know, I think he'd be an interesting, you know, a guy to uh, throw in there for a pay-per-view because I think the match would be fantastic. How were the matches? I, I don't even remember the matches. I went to one match in New Haven, Connecticut, towards the end of 1989, it was like I, I think it was either Christmas week or the week before Christmas week, and it was a Sunday night. And it was the and get, this is going to surprise you guys. It was the, like the one bad Ric Flair match I have ever seen, and the reason behind it, I've been told, was that it was a four o'clock show on a Sunday. It was the last. Uh, it was the last event before they like went home for vacation, so everyone was phoning it in. Everyone but me, who drove three hours to see this thing. <laughs> well, so I guess maybe my question, maybe my question to you, John, um, would be what it was it the the way the house shows were looking with these two, because for the most part, majority of '89, Muda was booked pretty strong i mean even you know the conclusion of of this main event where we're discussing like the heels look strong out of that so how does he go from looking that strong to by the time we get to starcade in december you know with that iron man tournament where he loses every single match and then we pretty much don't see him again until what 92 93 when he comes back Okay, I, I have two ways to answer. There are two answers to that question, uh, or two components to the answer. Number one, they wanted to keep it was it was basically like you had a tier of guys: Flair, Luger, and Sting, and then Muda was a tiny step down. But they were less concerned about protecting Muda than they were Luger, Flair, and Sting. The other component. Here's the thing: the in pro wrestling, especially in this era. The guys were not one big happy family. They were cliques. 
And there was kind of a Ric Flair click, you know, with Jim Cornette and Kevin Sullivan. And then there was the Gary Hart click. I don't really know who was in that Muda, I guess. And Gary, first of all, he managed great Muda for real. He wasn't just a guy who goes out there as a mouthpiece. He took care of Muda. And I think in the pro wrestling world, that is very much a conflict. And I know Gary was having was kind of on the inside out. I don't know exactly what happened, but he was having issues with the booking committee. So I understand. And that had something to do with Muda basically losing his push after Clash of the Champions 10. Uh, I want to go over to the uh, – because I am just jonesing to talk about this match because this may be the most surprising match of the decade. Okay, before we go to that though, I want to talk about like a very important component of okay. the of the tag team match, which is the main event. And th- this is why I think maybe I can put – you know, I'm older. I can put perspective on things. When we used to go to the supermarket when I was a kid growing up, they would put your stuff in paper bags. You'd bring your paper bags home. Then in the 80s, we switched to this person bagging your groceries. Would you like paper or plastic? Plastic bags had just come in. And in the mid 80s, we started having problems with kids putting the plastic bags over their heads and dying. So when I see the angle where Terry Funk comes out, And you can tell he shouldn't be out there. His arm is in terrible shape. And he wraps a plastic bag around Ric Flair's head. I was watching this with a group of three other people. And we were all in in our mid-20s. And we're all like, oh, my God, no, this is the worst idea I've ever seen. And to no one's surprise, the plastic bag angle was just a major controversy. Everyone got in trouble over it. You know, people were asking Jim Hurd, why didn't you do something to stop this? It was a complete catastrophe. Didn't he do this on multiple occasions? Uh, uh, not that I'm aware of. I thought I, I, I remember him doing this. I know. I thought I remember him doing this on one of the regular shows. No, no, okay. they only did it once, and and this was the only time it was done on national TV. And I I did read the newsletters that the next day the um. I mean, the switchboard on WTBS was, you know, ringing off the hook with people complaining about it. How much was this planned? Pro- uh, probably not a real. Not, that's just the way this promotion was going at the time. That they, they didn't really have a lot of long term. Any long term plan they had was a tentative plan at best. Um, and I have the feeling that if. Someone had come up with the if they had known for two weeks that, yeah, we're going to do a plastic bag angle that someone would have said, no, don't do it. Like someone with the authority to say no. Well, that's what I was wondering if this was a Terry Funk, Ric Flair ad lib like right before the show. It very well may have been, but I doubt it. And you're right. I mean, look at look at. What was going on that night, you know, they figure out like maybe two days before the show that their main event is going to have to change because Terry Funk is on the shelf. I mean, it was it was just a a very violent, very real angle. You could see the people at ringside, you know, were screaming. They think Terry Funk's literally trying to kill Ric Flair, which is something you want to stay away from in wrestling. They come back, you know, they go to a commercial, they come back, they announce that Brian Pillman has done CPR on Ric Flair and Ric Flair is, you know, being surrounded by a doctor and they they're giving them that thing where, you know, they they push air into your lungs to help you breathe again. It, it was just too violent and it wasn't the direction that that, you know, their their head company, WTBS, wanted them going in. Well, I mean, Brandon, what do you what did you think? I've already kind of spoke about it. What do you think about this angle with the bag? Do you think it was as uh, damning as John does? Um, I think that it wasn't. I think it was a little over the top. I don't think it was necessary to push the, you know, to further push the funk wants to kill flair angle. I think we kind of already already had that in place. Um Obviously, now, 30 years later, if they do something like that, you're going to have kids doing it and lawsuits and all type of media outlets after you. 
Uh, but one thing I did note uh, about that angle that uh, probably the one thing outside of plugging the hotline that Cornette and um, Ross did throughout the night was they kept using the word tragic and tragedy uh, as if Flair actually had died uh, via being suffocated by this plastic bag. Uh, but overall, yeah, I, I mean, it was fine. I, it, it, it added to it. Uh, but it was just one of those things where you didn't necessarily need it. And knowing the, you know, the sensitive nature of actually trying to uh, attempt to kill someone uh, in the ring, they probably could have left it out for me. I, I didn't need it to further the whole Flair hates Funk, Funk hates Flair thing. I, I didn't need it. Yeah, I'm in total agreement with you. But anyway, moving on to the next match, Lex Luger against Tommy Wildfire Rich. Um this match obviously was originally going to be Lex Luger against Ricky Steamboat, but about a month ago, uh, talks between Ricky Steamboat and the company fell through and Ricky abruptly went home, ending that feud. And then to get the Lex Luger versus Tommy Rich feud going, what a, what a blazing feud starter. We'd have Gordon Soley on the news segment looking at the camera and saying, gee, why is Lex Luger saying all these bad things about Tommy Rich? Oh, that's going to sell me a ticket. But yeah, Rob, I want to give Tommy Rich credit. He did not look great physically here, especially compared to Lex Luger. But you should have seen what he looked like in 1988. He was really out of shape. I mean, it showed there was no hiding it. And they, when WTBS bought the company, Tommy inquired about coming in because Dusty and he had heat with Dusty and Crockett. They weren't going to hire him. And they told him, look, get in shape and we'll bring in. And he worked really hard to get in that shape that he was in. Corny put him over like a million bucks from the beginning of the match to the end of the match. He brought up the fact that uh, that um, Luger did not win the world championship yet, but Tommy has. That Tommy was the veteran. He's, you know, the more professional. He went through this whole thing. He put him over the whole match. And I will give the man credit. This was without question Tommy Rich's best match in three years. He was fantastic. I mean, he just, I don't know. I, I have a feeling that Corny had something to do with giving him this spot. I don't know exactly how he got the spot, but he was he was just tremendous and all the credit in the world to him. Because this was, this. Uh, I, I will say Dave gave this four stars. But what did what was your memory? What was your knowledge, um, Brandon, of him at that time of Tommy Rich? So Rich is someone that I I never really saw um, in his prime. Uh, but in watching this match, uh, I could see how people would have been a big fan of his maybe five, six, seven years prior. Um, and kind of what you said, I think Cornette and a bit Ross really help sell rich as maybe not somebody that would outright beat Luger, but somebody that had a place to be in uh, a match against, you know, the, the number two guy in the promotion. Uh, so I thought he did a fine job um, in regards to, you know, uh, obviously his physique. I, I don't really recall how he looked prior to, to 89. Um, but obviously standing in there next to Luger, he looked like, you know, he had had, you know, a couple, one too many catfish dinners. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I thought Rich was was fine in this match. And, and, and to be honest, it made me actually kind of curious about earlier Rich stuff just to see how good he worked, you know, when he was in better shape and when he was, he was younger and in his prime. And I liked how they did bring up the fact that he, uh, you know, had been NWA champion before. Um, kind of just everything about, you know, how they called the match to the actual work in the ring think that added to making this this a really good match because I mean on paper you would think 1989 Luger who obviously I know a lot of us you know kind of gush over uh, 89 heel Luger versus Tommy Rich it's like um what why why is this happening uh but Rich actually he held his own in there and I, I was very impressed uh with what I saw from him you know, I, I respect the hell out of Tommy Rich for how hard he worked to get in the shape that he was. He obviously busted his tail on this night because he had to know this is going to be the biggest audience he was he had ever wrestled in front of. Uh he had been, you know, the business had not been particularly kind to Tommy Rich for over for the last three or four years. But from a management standpoint, 
I just don't see how you can use him in this role. There had to be a better alternative than sending Tommy Rich out there against Lex Luger. I mean, he looked like the world's oldest 33-year-old. He looked like the third Mulkey brother. And I, I think he definitely should have had a place in that company, you know, on the undercard, he's a nostalgia act. If he's reliable, that's great. I just don't see him in the semi-main event against Lex Luger. I, I, I yeah, I agree. It's I, I did not have a great opinion. A lot of these guys, I saw Rich's really great stuff later on. I was not aware of any of that at this point. Uh, same with when I was seeing Buzz Sawyer. I never saw really any of his you know good stuff until later on. Uh, but yeah, Rich really should. not be I was excited to see it, but I could see if you know, but actually, me at the time or Brandon coming in and seeing like, oh, who is this? Please spare me. And I want, I don't want to get that excited by the effort he put in because he was fantastic. It really is best match in years. But I'm what this. Uh, this has Cornette written all over it. I don't know how much influence Cornette may have had on the booking committee or something like that, but this really has a feeling of they're sitting there like we don't. Want want to have someone job out to Lex in this last second deal. It's a one off. I just need someone in there to, you know, get a good match out of the guy. He's not the featured attraction here. It's just, you know, one, take the loss and see where we go. And at that point, I can picture Cornette going, hey, why not Tommy? You know, he could take the loss here and whatever. It won't mess anything up and you can go, you know, especially from what John just said about Steamboat. That makes a lot more sense now. Just putting him in in one spot. I'm I'm wondering who saw. I'm guessing it was it was Corny who got somebody's ear and was able to uh, to uh, to sell them. What did you think of uh, Brandon? What did you think of Lex at the time? Uh, so eighty nine Lex is is one of my favorite you know um, errors for a guy. Although I did love him as a face in eighty eight, uh, chasing Flair for the belt, but. Uh, I thought everything about Luger specifically on this night was, was great. His, his, his promo leading up, uh, his work leading up was awesome. He, he, he was always the physical specimen that, you know, kind of everybody loved, you know, he, he had the body, the million dollar body, but around this time, his, his interviews had become really good and his whole cocky bravado, just his whole mentality, his whole vibe, his whole aura just was was just great and i thought he obviously his work with steamboat was really good we know um johnny mac um is is big on you know his 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 matches with steamboat uh but i thought just luger just as a heel 89 i, I thought he could have been if there was no flair around at the time uh, we can obviously you know debate whether or not flair in 89 was was still still needed to be the guy uh it could have easily been luger and i think you know, by the time he did finally get the the top belt in what was it, ninety one, ninety two? Obviously, I think it was a little bit too late at that point. He could have easily been the number one guy uh, in the promotion at that point. He was excellent all the way around. My own opinion is that after you know Luke came in eighty seven, I want to be a horseman. He was a little bit. He was still getting acclimated. He was still learning, but he was good in the role. Eighty eight was his big baby face run, and. The fans were into him, but there were some awkward moments. And then when they turned him again in 89, my own thing, my own opinion, observation was, okay, this is his role. This is where he belongs. The number one heel in the promotion. It, for years, I would have gone like Luger and friends, you know, Barry Windham and whoever, against Flair, the babyface, and his friends, Arn Anderson, Sting, whoever. Um I mean, Lex, what you saw in Lex in 89 is what you got. I actually was lucky enough uh, after one of the shows, like maybe one in the morning, someone who, who I had mutual friends with Lex Luger, I bumped into him and Lex is like, hey, let's go get something to eat. So there's like four of us. We go to a Denny's and Lex, you know how Denny's it's surrounded by windows. Lex couldn't keep his eyes off himself. He kept staring at himself in in the window, which acted as a mirror. It was an absolute thing of beauty. He's just a better heel. I, I just, I, 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 it just comes across. But I, and this is really one of his best stretches uh, as far as his in ring work, because usually to get a good match match out of Lex, you had to have somebody a steamboat 
or a flare or you know somebody of a high caliber like that or a Wyndham or somebody like that. But I mean now you get he's getting decent matches with uh, Hayes. He's getting decent matches, you know, with Rich. Even though Rich is tremendous here, uh, this is old school Rich. I work in the crowd, and you can see the best. The tribute to Rich, you can hear the crowd start to build because it was a cold. That that was one of the that was one match where the crowd was kind of a little bit kind of soft on it, but they started to build, and you could see Tommy start to get into it. Oh, that was a fun match. Another guy. I like better as a heel is uh, is uh, Mike Rotundo because uh, the next match we have is Doc against uh, the Captain. I love Mike as a heel, and I didn't think they did enough with him. What do you, What do you like about Mike? Uh, do you, I, I um, what's your opinion of uh, Rotundo and Doc? Brandon. So um, yeah, as far as as far as that match goes, uh, the one thing I will definitely first note about Mike is. He might be the only man that I've ever seen sweat profusely just from applying a chin lock. Um, but the actual the actual uh, match itself. Uh, let me also say I'm I'm a, I'm a big Doctor Death fan. Uh, always thought he was just super badass. Always believable uh, in pretty much everything he did. Uh, and you had to know that a match between these two, um, Cornette and Ross, just probably lost it. Uh, with the amount of sports references they could squeeze in there uh, about about these two, uh, but the, the crowd was 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 into this match, um, and just the, the their styles kind of kind of meshed uh, in the sense that you know Rotunda was more was really methodical and wanted to kind of wear you know Doc down throughout the match or whatever, uh, and then Doc is you know with his high impact moves and that sort of thing. Um, so I, I enjoyed that match. Uh, I, I thought it was I thought it was good for for what it was. Kind of the the blow off with the whole you know varsity club thing. But as far as Rotunda goes, I never was really high on Rotunda. I kind of found him a little bit boring. Not necessarily uh, the way I view Larry Zabisco. Uh, but Rotunda was just kind of a chin lock headlock guy. He might hit you with an elbow drop uh, here and there, a leg drop here and there. Uh, but no, I, I wasn't really high on Rotunda, and especially by this point. Uh, which I thought he was kind of, you know, past uh, the point of being interesting, as I did think he was okay um, in that varsity club angle. Uh, I wasn't really a big fan of his at this point, more so a fan of Doc, uh, and I think that's kind of why I why I sort of enjoyed this match. I have in my note, Cornet fire hosing Rotundo's credentials. So, yeah, I think I'm going to agree with you on that, Brandon. Mike looks like an 80s film villain, uh, you know, a perfect like 1980s jock, you know, who's kind of arrogant and a little bit, I don't know, just a jerk. Mike Rotundo, I, I think more could have been done with him. Um, he basically by, by this point or soon thereafter, they should have found another guy with amateur credentials, put him in a tag team with Mike Rotundo, just called them the varsity club. And that could, have, that should have been the end of it. I mean, there's, believe me, there's only, there was only a hundred or so guys making a good living in the wrestling business at this point. And I think any of them, a lot of, you know, would be happy with that role. As far as, you know, Dr. Death goes, always been a big fan of his, but here's one thing this promotion was very bad at. They were bad at it in the Crockett days, and they're getting worse at it now. They have too many turns. Doc had turned heel less than a year ago and then had already turned back face by the summer of 1989. The best thing to do with Dr. Death Steve Williams is make him once again just a dumb killer jock who has no heart, no soul, just like hurting and destroying people. Give him Jim Cornette as his manager, and you have a main event heel, someone that could have been out there chasing Flair for months. I I just I'm a big Mike guy as a heel. As a face, I have no use for him. But is it because of what you just said? It's a heel that everyone can relate to. It's that guy in high. It's the, the Revenge of the Nerds guy. It's yes. that guy in high school that everybody hates. That just and he doesn't even have to speak it out. It just like exudes off him. And, and watching him and then watching Wyndham kind of do the same thing. They should have used them more as a heel in WWF. Just just as some just wildly arrogant. Oregon heel team because they both do it very well I, and I like the way Mike calls a match I there is a pacing to it and you just see it with all of his matches there's just kind of a, a it's a slow but everything means something 
everything they do, like, you know, as Brandon very appropriately said, he goes, he, he, the guy sweats during a headlock. <laughs> yep, because the headlock means something. You know, every component of a micro to match means something. I, I, I do. Yeah, he does need help. You're probably right, uh, John, that to bring in somebody, you know, as a tag team partner for him probably would have helped. But I'm just especially right around this stretch. And as a heel, I think he is uh, uh, tremendous. Your second most shocking good match <laughs> of the decade uh, comes next. We have the Brian Pillman with one of his greatest performances against Norman the Lunatic in what is without question his greatest match. I don't think there's it. Brandon, does he have a better match? Um, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and say no because his uh, Bastion Booger stuff wasn't um, too great. Uh, but I think uh, what I liked about this match was the it, w- it was just the the consummate big guy versus little guy, except Pillman was a little guy who who he he wrestled. He was a small guy in the ring, but he wrestled. I felt like he always wrestled bigger than he actually was. Um, so you know, just the whole dynamic of Norman being this huge, you know, bigger fat lunatic guy versus, um, you know, Pillman, the all American from Miami of Ohio, which, you know, Ross pointed out for us, uh, 32 times. Um, I thought, I thought it was, it, it was a really good match for what it was. Uh, I thought Pillman carried Norman around well enough for what was it, like five, six, seven minutes. Um, and, um, I think this was just kind of, um, the starting point for, for Pillman. Cause he, he had some really good stuff that he ended up doing, you know, with Luger uh, later on. And Pillman's a guy that I, I, I've just always been high on. I was high on him even when he, you know, could barely walk pretty much in, in, in the Attitude Era uh, in the WWF. Uh, so, yeah, it was um, – I, I, I liked the match. Uh, it was, like I said, the, the, the classic little man beats big man thing. And, uh, yeah, I thought, I thought Pillman drug Norman out for those few minutes and, and made it pretty exciting. My own opinion on Brian Pillman in 1989, here's a guy who is a, should have been a huge part of this company's future. He was only 27. He was as, as athletic as could be. He had a really good look. I think Brian being a little bit smaller actually worked to his advantage because he could come across as an underdog. Um, you know, I, I was thinking really the, the, the sky was the limit for this guy, world's heavyweight champion. And at this point, Ric Flair in real life has taken a liking to Brian Pillman and he, you know, you notice like Ric Flair would go out and he would do his interview with Sting. After this event on TV, you would see Ric Flair, Sting, and Brian Pillman doing interviews together. So they're at this point, they're getting behind Brian Pillman. Quick question about Pillman at this stage: How early was this for him, John? Um, was it uh, as far as you know in his career? As far as how many like major matches he's had on major events? Um, I would go as far as to say this was the very first one. Pillman had been wrestling exclusively in Calgary, I believe. I think he started in 86 or early 87, and he made the trip out to Atlanta like March, April 1989. So he is a fresh face on TV. The reason I ask is because Pillman had a very tunnel vision look. He did not have that normal kind of out there look he would have when he was coming to the – he was just – dialed in from the mo- even with the cheerleaders all jumping around he's just kind of staring right through them yeah so you could tell this is like he's feeling this he had one little stretch where and this stuff didn't happen he had a quick springboard uh a drop kick off the top rope he did the randy savage you know tip of the hat to you brandon Randy Savage uh-huh. axe handle off the top rope. And I mean he he was fine. And even even Mike Shaw, God bless him, he took a nasty bump against the post when he went, you know, uh so he was bumping around too. I mean it was just but you could tell for Pillman this was a big deal for him. Uh uh just 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 just, just from his attitude and but uh, I guess I guess David gave it grudgingly three stars. Cause he's oh, it was just a short sent- match. Yeah, that's he's like I get he's just too good not to you know give because it was only three minutes, three thirty eight, but I mean they they made every minute of it worthwhile. 
A quick aside about this match I have once heard. It may have been from the Observer, uh, John, that the, the match, the Freebirds against the Steiners, unbelievably the Steiners' first title shot, um, uh, that that match was put on exactly at 9 p.m. to counter Roseanne. That is bizarre. Huh. Uh, I have never heard that before, but right before this match started, I want to get both of you guys' opinion on this. By the way, the reason I said that was, was that Dave, um, Dave, that, uh, Dave Meltzer mentioned that. Okay. That, I, I mean, why would they do that? Like, okay, this is the match I want to go up against Roseanne with. Well, because Scott, Scott, uh, Scotty Stein is involved. And Scott really, you know what? Scott wasn't starting to get his big push yet. He was kind of just at this point, he's kind of starting to get out of the uh, Rick Steiner's little brother shadow. But I, I want to talk about this before this match. They had a segment where Missy Hyatt and Robin Green went shopping. And Robin, apparently Rick gave this girl his credit card and they went out to jewelry stores and to a mall. And she just like ran up all kinds of charges on his card. And it's hard to make a segment with a 24 year old Missy Hyatt and a 25 year old Nancy Sullivan boring. But they managed this thing. I mean, I have seen both Missy and and uh Nancy act and they're way better actors usually than they were in this segment and you can do as many takes as you need to but it was absolutely muggy out there plus everyone anyone who is watching this wrestling show knows who Nancy Sullivan is they don't know she's Nancy Sullivan but they've seen her as woman they've seen her on TV not as woman as a fallen angel they've seen her on TV before she was a really poor choice we're just a bad choice in casting on this. And on top of that, this was a segment that made me say, oh, this is getting further and further away from the wrestling that I like. Yeah, the WWF's been doing this for five years at least, but I was hoping the NWA could be an oasis away from that. And here they are with the with the unbelievably bad segments. And let's see the note I have for the segment you just referred to. Fast forward. Good choice, <laughs> which is pretty much exactly what it deserves. So I will, I will, uh, I, I will defer to somebody who must have more experience in this topic than me, Brandon. <laughs> it was, uh, it was, it was oddly uncomfortable um, because, uh, as you guys noted, that like I hadn't really seen them act, if you will, prior to that. I mean, other than just being ballets, uh, but they looked uncomfortable filming the segment. Uh, but I guess you know the bigger picture of it. It kind of sort of pushed that you know robin nancy woman whatever you want to call her kind of had you know a a different little bit of an agenda you know let me go and take my man's credit card and just run it up and that sort of thing and you know you have rick steiner this all-american you know the dog face gremlin guy and and his valets running his credit card up so it was kind of like an underlying thing like okay this this chick isn't as wholesome i guess or down to earth as as we think she is but yeah from a guy who uh you know often rants and raves about you know vintage 80s caucasian women uh <laughs> they were beautiful women in the segment but it it was bad and 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 like you said sg it was uh it was definitely fast forward material for sure especially given the fact that right after that you know scott steiner one of the most amazing guys in the company at the time uh, was about to come on. So yeah, it's definitely a, a fast forward material and yeah, it, uh, it, it helped push that she was a little, maybe a little bit crooked maybe. Uh, but yeah, the acting was, it, it was atrocious. It was bad. Well, but let's get on to the match. Talk about a major surprise. I had forgotten how good this match was. I mean, this might have been the last great night of the Freebirds because, first of all, Jimmy Garvin came out and did a killer interview. Michael Hayes played his role so well, you would think he was part of the band Spinal Tap out there with that white leather jacket he had on. And the Freebirds. I mean, oh my God! They had an un- they had they worked their tails off, and they had an unbelievably good match with the Steiners. 
this was Hayes in 1982 all over again. You might as well have just taken uh, Rick Steiner out and put in Kerry Von Erich. It was the same deal. Oh, was he feeling it? He was fantastic. He was he was like the great revelation. This was his best work in a long time. Meaning Hayes. He he. They did this bit where they were picking on Rick Steiner and basically you know for being a, you know for being a doofus, and uh, they did this really funny one bit where. Michael was just kind of hitting on the women and he did the one bit where he was like waving his hips and would stop like second Rick would look and then Rick would look away and he'd do the hip thing again. So finally, you, you know, Michael's like, it's not me. And then you see Rick try to do the hip thing and he, with the grace of Jackie Gleason on the Honeymooners. Uh, so it, this was kind of the match, but it worked. It, you were using even I will agree, even Jimmy Garvin was throwing some potatoes out there. So, I mean, the Freebirds were flying in this match. This was, yeah, this was probably one of the best uh, matches at the end. And I know what you're saying. This was the beginning of Scott's push. This is one of those things where I think the push is coming at the end (laughs) of the crowd reaction. Because Scott Steiner most definitely had this cult following going on for his freakish moves. At one stretch, he busts out two Frankensteiners in the middle of the ring on both Freebirds. I mean, he is he he is at his size is he's doing the same stuff Muda is, except he's 30 pounds bigger. Yeah, I think Scott at this point um, was doing things that, again, kind of like what I mentioned about Muda, doing things that we had just never seen. The Scott Steiner, uh, Frankensteiner, the tilt a whirl, all these different things that he was doing. Um, and he just had he had that look. He had a really solid look. Uh, his build was crazy. Um Rick's too, to an extent, although Rick, you know, was, you know, he had the singlet, so we really didn't see him with the shirt off. Uh, But he was, he was, they both were really, really good workers. I thought Uh, for somebody who doesn't really uh, at this point, not really a free birds guy. I'm not a huge Michael Hayes guy. I'm not a huge Jimmy Garvin guy, but I thought they busted their ass on this particular night. I thought maybe they thought in their mind, probably kind of what you guys have been saying was, Hey, this is the clash. This might be one of our last showcase matches. Let's go ahead and put our best foot forward and make it happen. And I, I thought it was a really good match. Um, I thought the ending was 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 fine and kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier uh, during that little little segment they had with Missy and uh, and Woman uh, about her being a little crooked. So it kind of actually played right into you know the the conclusion of this, if you will. Uh, but yeah, Scott, Scott was awesome. Um, and I kind of, that kind of led me to, uh, want to know the question of Rick or Scott as champ. I know they dusty kind of toyed with Rick beating flair in like 30 seconds or something back in, I think it was 88, but were there any plans to, to do anything with Rick or Scott as champ moving forward? Or was it strictly, let's keep these guys in a tag team, uh, and put them up against other teams that we formed. Brandon, it's funny you should ask that because in my notes it says stuck in tag team. As and that's me shorthand for saying these guys should not be stuck in a tag team for much longer. Um the reality is in wrestling, the tag teams did not make the money that guys like Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan did. And here we are with Scott Steiner, 24 years old. Sean, when you said he was 30 pounds heavier than Muda, I think that's way conservative. Uh, I mean, the guy was, you know, the guy had a great build. He had a great look. I think he was the kind of wrestler that the girls would like because he was good looking, but the guys would also like because he wasn't a pretty boy. I mean, at this point, I, I just see the, the the sky being the limit for Scott Steiner. Um, I know by the end, maybe not now, September 12th, 1989, but by the end of 1989, I was saying maybe Sting isn't the long-term guy. Maybe Scott Steiner is the guy who should be the long-term Hulk. Hogan, you know, guy on top of the card, world's heavyweight champion. Two asides about this match that I didn't realize at the time. One, I had discovered uh, going through the old observers, which was the fact that those were not the tag team championships that they were holding, the Freebirds were holding. I guess one of them got lost on the road. Yes. So uh, they are holding the retired six men tag team championships and uh, the other was and john did you see this because uh, I, I i don't want to hang brandon out to dry on this one yet did you see what i was talking about with uh, steiner and um and uh, hayes in the corner 
I, I did, and when you uh, instant messaged me about that, it had been 30 years since the event, and I had never seen it. Can you tell the audience like what you saw? I'm going to even give you the time because I wrote it down just in case. But I, I, I was watching again. I did not see this at the time, just like John. But I, and like that's why I didn't want to hang you out to dry here, Brandon. But when I saw it this time the other day, I noticed it. At uh, going off of the show on the network, this is around 38:15. Rick is in the corner with Hayes doing the 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 ten punch deal. Uh, Rick's on top, and you know Rick's doing that breathing thing, and you hear the crowd, you know, one, two, three. They get to eight, and you hear Rick very clearly go, "I can't hear you," which uh, I, I guess they were trying to do the spot. So uh, as they come down. He, Rick throws Michael into the other corner. Michael comes off the corner with this look of terror. Knowing that he has no idea what what Rick's about to do, and I'm not sure Rick knew. And finally, he throws out a like a. It was supposed to be a clothesline, but they basically just collided in the center of the ring. Um, it, I, like I said, I didn't want to because I did not notice this until the other day. But I love finding stuff like that. It just it just adds something to it. Um, did I, I like I said I don't want to hang you out to dry. Did you notice that, Brandon? Or no, I. I I actually did not. I did not catch that. Uh, that's that's funny. Uh, now I'm gonna go back and actually watch that. No, I, I didn't catch that. Um, but what I will ask is, what did you guys think of of the actual ending? I mean, everyone had to know who it was that tripped Steiner, um, and then of course the cameras didn't catch uh, who did it, even after showing us multiple replays. Uh, but despite the fact that all 2,600 uh, attendees pointed to a uh, woman as the person that tripped uh, Scott, we still had them down there arguing about who would have done it. And yeah. So what did you guys think about that? Sean, you, you go first. What did they think they were going to prove with the camera? Oh, uh, well, we didn't see it. The announcers didn't see it. The rep didn't see it. Yeah. Well, 2,600 people saw it. I mean, come on. What, what, were that, what was that supposed to prove? That they're not going to, you know, as Brandon said, everybody knew who it was. And supposedly they had this, uh, I, I guess uh, another thing they mentioned in the Observer was that, uh, I gotta go, um, that they were going to do this thing where Rick proposed to Nancy. I mean, how? Like, I, I don't remember Nancy here at this point at all, John. Oh yeah, she had just gotten there. That she was done the uh, Nancy Green. She was this like nerdish girl from Milwaukee. Like you know, like Milwaukee's not a major city or anything. And all of a sudden, like one day, she transformed into what would eventually be known as woman. But I mean, as far as the the proposal goes, I mean, you know, Rick Steiner does have a reputation of moving kind of fast in relationships. Uh, I mean. I, I didn't – I mean – and at the end of it, I want to talk about something you mentioned, Sean, that they were in the ring with the cameras, and they caught the guys talking to each other. They did that again in the main event. Dick Slater and Ric Flair were clearly talking to each other, and Jim Cornette covered for them. He's like, oh, yeah, Dick Slater's telling Ric Flair what he's going to do to him and all this stuff. So, I mean, hey, we tried, but we're we're in a new age of technology 30 years ago as far as having cameras on the apron and you know audio equipment right by where they're speaking. Um I just, you know, I thought it was a good match. Oh, at the end, you got Jim Ross and Jim Cornette saying, you know, oh, the fans are pointing to both Missy and and Robin, and clearly everyone's pointing at Robin. So that was a bit of an embarrassment. So uh, this, uh, what, 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 what were they planning to get out of this from here? I mean, did, did anything happen? Again, I don't even remember. Did they do anything with Robin Green? Oh yeah, they before about two weeks after this, they had a deal where Scott met her somewhere, and she says to him, "Yeah, you know, hey, don't trip again, Scott." And he says, "No, don't worry, I won't trip again." And two guys got out of the limo and beat the crap out of Scott, and that's what led up to the Steiners versus Woman's new tag team. She revealed herself as Woman, and they turned out to be Doom. 
Well, one last thing. We're almost we're almost out of time as usual. This hour always goes by too so fast. They had a match between Sid Vicious and Ranger Ross. And I just want to throw this in really quickly. Ranger Ross is one of the nicest, coolest guys I'd ever met. I met him in 89 and you know, spent some time, hung out. He answered my questions. Very pleasant guy. And then we learned maybe five years later that he's part of this like gang that goes around robbing banks and around Atlanta. So not a very happy ending to that one. I want to first thank Brandon Rice for coming on. Brandon, you were an awesome guest. Thank you for taking the time. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, guys. I've, I've been waiting to get, get get my time to shine on here, so thank you. Uh, you took advantage of it. Uh, Sean, I want to thank you for everything you do for this show. I want to thank our producer, Lou Kippelman. You guys have no idea how hard this guy works. Like He's the guy behind you know everything we do. Um, when something goes wrong, Lou's the guy that fixes it. And yeah, I want to once again invite everyone to join our Facebook group. And all you have to do is put in Stick to Wrestling and it'll pop right up. And this podcast has been a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Go Vols!